Hello and welcome to the History of Medieval Philosophy. My name is Mark Thorsby. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at really one of the treasures of the medieval world in terms of philosophy, and that is we're going to be taking a look at Boethius. Boethius is frequently referred to as the last of the Roman philosophers, or maybe you might say the first of the scholastic theologians. But ultimately, what you could say is that Boethius really is this in-between uh, figure in between the Roman classical world and in between the rise of the medieval age, the, the age of me medieval scholastic philosophy. Um, see, his, he had a number of great contributions in philosophy. Um, probably his most lasting contribution, to be honest, is his translation of Aristotle and elements of Plato into Latin, and particularly his translation of the logical treatises of Aristotle, or what's referred to as Aristotle's organon. Um, he also did also have a whole range of commentaries on Aristotle and Plato. Unlike many of the people in his own day, um, and he lived from around 475 to roughly 526, um, so he lived for into his 40s and 50s, um, he was um, really, unlike most people of his day, he was extraordinarily gifted in terms of the fact that he knew um, Greek well. He not only knew Greek, but he knew it very well. Most people did not. And so he spent a lot of his time translating Greek text into Latin text um, so that people could read these Latin texts. In particular, he, he originally envisioned that he would translate all of Plato and all of Aristotle and then also write commentaries on all of the work. Um, he, that actually, unfortunately, never came to fruition. But the work that he did translate and the commentaries he did write were extremely important and would continue to be used uh, really for over well over 1,500 years. Uh, so he had an enormous impact in terms of the scholarship of philosophy in European philosophy into the Middle Ages. Um, his... Um, in terms of his theology, he was also one of these early philosophers, similar to Augustine, who began to articulate technical philosophical argumentation in order to address, um, you know, very difficult theological problems such as the Trinity. Now, so he wrote many texts, but probably the text for which he's most well known, his own original text, is the Consolations of Philosophy. And this is, quote, a noble vision of the philosophical life. Here's a sort of picture of it. And we'll talk a little bit about it because that's something to do with his biography here, and I'll mention that in a minute. The ultimately the question is, how can we li li have, live happy lives when our lives appear to be um, random or given to chance or to fortune? You can see on the one hand of this wheel of fortune is you have people who are knightly and who are doing well and benefiting. And on the other side, you have people who have been turned upside down and lives have been ruined. And so given the fact that we can't control what happens in our world and, and ultimately we can't uh, control our fates, how can we be happy? And this is actually a really important question uh, for all of us, but it, 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 rise, it, rise, it propels Boethius to offer a defense of philosophy. Now I should say it's also a personal problem because Boethius himself is actually writing this in prison awaiting execution himself. Uh, so it's in very much a, a piece of literature that was, you know, um, very much close to his own biography. He himself is the character in it. So we're going to talk about that here in a moment. Um, some of the other key ideas that Boethius introduces or furthers along uh, include the basic distinction between faith and reason and the dichotomy between these two things. Um, <clears throat> frequently, uh, faith and reason in these early medieval years was not well distinguished. Um, and so, f and so, that, and that's actually quite important because that seems to be one of the demarcating features between philosophy on the one hand and theology on the other. Another really important distinction that Boethius introduces is the distinction between being and that which is. So, in other words, he distinguishes um, the idea that the idea that um, on the one hand things have existence, but on the other hand. Things have a conceptual essence to them. This would actually essentially lay the groundwork for an important distinction that would later be argued by Aquinas and others is the distinction between essence and existence. And so this first sort of early version of the distinction we see in Boethius' work. Some of the key problems that, um, and questions that Boethius raises is particularly the problem of universals. And we already introduced a general question about 
um, universals in some of our previous videos because it's an important problem that really takes up a lot of the work in the Middle Ages. And the problem of universals is what kind of being do universals have? And so the example here I always give is the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, is a universal, right? So it doesn't matter where on earth or really where in the universe you are, that theorem will always be true. So that theorem is universally true. So the question is, what kind of existence do, does a universal have such that it's true everywhere? Um, and so this sort of question of universals is a problem that's constantly coming up uh, throughout the entire Middle Ages, but even with this very, very early figure in the history of medieval philosophy, Boethius, we see its initial version, the, the initial framework for talking about this problem is laid out by Boethius. In fact, later medieval philosophers would continue to essentially utilize the same language and distinctions that Boethius himself introduces. Another important question here that's related is whether or not genera and species subsist in themselves or do they exist only in the mind? So for instance, there's the distinction between the genus and the species of something, right? So if I say, if I take the genus business, and then one of the species of that business might be, let's say, Home Depot, or a, or, a, um, or any other kind of store, particular store, that's a species of a greater genus. And so the question is, the distinction between genera and species, is this a distinction that's simply in the mind, or does it a distinction that has real bearing on the world? Um, so there's a whole range of questions that's similar to these that Boethius introduces um, that are important. Now, let's talk a little bit about his biography. And I put from top to bottom because what we see is that Boethius seems to be born in fortune, and yet he, he dies um, in misfortune. So, for instance, he was born in 475 to actually a senatorial family within the late Roman Empire. He became one of the most well-educated people in the world, right, translating Greek into Latin. Um, but after doing these translations, after a number of years, he entered politics, and he came to the attention of Theodoric the Ostrogoth, who was in charge um, of the larger um, um, R Holy Roman Empire, which was ruled at the end of his life by Justin the Emperor, Emperor Justin in Constantinople. Now, he was appointed in, as consul in 510, which is a very important position. Um, and then eventually he was appointed master of offices in 522. So he was living high on the hog, as it were, and doing quite well for himself, becoming extremely successful, both as a philosopher, as an academic, if you will, as well as in terms of his political life as a statesman. But unfortunately, he was accused of treason and imprisoned. Uh, we know very little about what he was accused of and why he was imprisoned. Um, but we do know there was a sort of plot against Emperor Justin. Justin um, and so King... Th King Theodoric seems to have arrested him. Uh, while he was in prison, awaiting execution, he wrote the Consolation of Philosophy. Um, and then he was executed in 526 or somewhere along those lines. Um, so that's generally what happened in his life. And so his life essentially mirrors the problem that we're going to be taking a look at in the Constellations of Philosophy, which isn't really, a pro isn't really a surprise, I don't think. Now, Gibbon referred to this as a golden volume. It, it was not unworthy of the leisure of Plato. So this text is very, very important. And in fact, during the Middle Ages, it was probably the most well-read text. So anyone, uh, who was, anyone who had any education in the European world during the Middle Ages would have known this text. So it became extremely well-known. It's too bad um, that its author, unfortunately, could not have seen uh, that sort of success. Now, one of the things that's interesting is the form of the text. The form alternates between prose and verse. So it alternates between a dialogue that... Uh, Boethius is having with lady philosophy um, <clears throat> and then and then it jumps into poetry that sort of syn uh, synthesizes uh, the discussion that was laid out by lady philosophies. Now what's the basic setup? We're not going to overview the entire work here. We're going to look at books three and to the end of the end of the work but essentially Boethius is sitting in his prison cell awaiting um, awaiting death. Um, essentially, and he's in grief, you know, wondering, feeling bad for himself, how could this have happened to him, and so on and so forth. And then suddenly, lo and behold, Lady Philosophy, a sort of mythical um, goddess, if you will, visits Boethius in his cell and offers him a consolation for his grief. She says, quote, Be not overcome by your misfortunes, uh, for the gifts of fortune are fleeting, and happiness is not to be found in temporal goods. Only by being like God, who is the highest good, 
can lasting happiness come to man, end quote. So Lady Philosophy basically says, listen, the reason you're unhappy is because you think that your life is about as about obtaining fortunes and that misfortune is a bad thing. But she argues that having fortune, good or ill, is not is not the goal. And that's not what happiness is. Rather, happiness is um, found in God. And so ultimately you have to move in that direction. And, but in particular, it's not just the idea that happiness is found in God. So you should go pray and feel bad and, you know, pray to God. It's not that at all. Instead, lady philosophy says we can use our reason to understand that happiness is not to be found in temporal goods. We can use our reason to understand that fortune and misfortune alike are actually both good things. And that we can also learn that happiness comes to that person who's good, regardless of what it may appear to be. And so philosophy, essentially reason, offers us counsel in terms of the griefs and the tragedies we bear. Now, Boethius is, of course, writing this a very, very long time ago, right, 1,600 years ago or something like that. Um, But the problems he's addressing are quite pertinent to our own problems. Some of the key topics that, that Boethius discusses here in the text is Uh, For instance, the problem of evil. How could there be evil in the world if there's a good God? And, and, And why is there evil? Another problem that gets discussed is the problem of fate or providence. If there's a God and God knows all things that are going to happen, then how is it that we can actually be free, right? And why would there be evil in the world if God's actually in charge of how things occur? And then, of course, the question is freedom and human will and knowledge. That is, can we really be free? Can the human will really choose something if God already has foreknowledge of all things? And finally, one of the things we see in general is, interestingly enough, is a defense of Stoicism. Now, I should say clearly that um, Boethius does not address the Stoic philosophers, so he's not quoting the Stoics here. But what we do see is that the line of argumentation that he develops essentially follows in the footsteps of the Stoic philosophers. Of the philosophers that Boethius primarily discusses, it would be Plato. And in many ways, he offers a defense of Plato's own views of things, in particular the notion that God, the notion that God must be all good and that um, that's at the top of the hierarchy of being, as it were. So he's in, he's in favor of those sorts of things. He's also in favor of the idea that knowledge is more important than, um, I'm sorry, that our knowledge rests upon reason rather than our senses and our experience. So there's in many ways that Boethius is a Neoplatonic philosopher, but really, I think, interestingly enough, he really develops a sort of Christian version of Stoicism in this text in particular. And that's particularly important because you'll remember in our last lecture on Augustine, City of God, we saw that Augustine was particularly... Um, aggressive towards Stoicism in terms of denouncing Stoicism. So we see a sort of pushback here in the Christian world with a bit of a defense of Stoicism. So that might be something worth thinking about for any of your papers you're writing. Okay, so what's the basic structure of the book? I'm not, it, basically, we're going to be looking today at really just books three, prose nine through 12, and then book four and book five. So that's kind of what we're going to be taking a look at in this text. It's a short text, actually, so you're welcome to go read it. It's quite beautiful because, again, it's a dialogue between Boethius and Lady Philosophy where Boethius is essentially questioning why things are the way they are, um, why is there evil, and so forth. And Lady Philosophy is providing the the answers and and so on and so forth. So it reads very much like a platonic dialogue. But then it is interrupted with poetry. So after prose 9, you get verse, you get, I'm sorry, uh, meter 9. And then you get prose 10, meter 10, and so on and so forth. I'm principally just going to follow the prose. There is, I'm going to read one of the meters and one of the poems to you. Uh, but I'm not going to focus on that, but it's quite a beautiful text. And I think that as you read it, you'll understand why so many people love this text for so many years. Uh, but just give you a sense of the structure of the writing. So let's sort of jump into book three. And if you wanted to say what is the basic discussion going on where we're jumping in at, it's the question of what is true happiness? What does it mean to have happiness? So here you can ask yourself, you can pause the video and you can ask yourself, what do I think happiness is? Um, And you'll find that you may have many answers for happiness. But what is true happiness such that it's always available and it's and it's it's real? So, for instance, I perhaps as a young man, I might think that happiness resides in having a strong body and looking good. 
for instance, you know, when I go to the beach, I mean, she could probably tell I'm not the most, I don't have the most luxurious figure, as, as you might say. Uh, but when I go to the beach, there's these young men who are just built and they're, you know, they're just, you know, they're all muscles and they're gorgeous, right? I'm obviously not one of those people. But here's the thing is if happiness is that if happiness is having a certain physique or looking a certain way, then that means happiness is always fleeting. Because as we get older, our bodies degrade. So even the, the, you know, the muscle man on the beach, at some point, if he lives long enough, or if she lives long enough, will become a sad, droopy, uh, uh, impoverished and weak person eventually, right? Because the body decays. So if happiness can't be, true happiness can't be the body. So what is true happiness? Maybe true happiness is pleasure. But then there is another problem, right? Because if true happiness is pleasure, one of the things we notice is that every time we gain a pleasure, right, that pleasure is also fleeting. It's gone as soon as we attain it, right? So for instance, another example, since we're talking about the body, is think about sexuality and sexual um, intercourse. When people have sex, there's pleasure that they gain from that. But as soon as they attain that pleasure, that pleasure is almost gone as soon as it's um, experienced. And this is true for all pleasures. So for instance, I'm drinking a, a Starbucks coffee here. I love coffee. But as soon as I satisfy that and have the pleasure of the taste, it's gone. It's fleeting. So it can't be the case that taste and, and pleasure is simply is true happiness. Because what we want to know is what is happiness in a persistent and in a self-sufficient manner. And this is actually the key point that we're going to begin on here and that Bo we're jumping in at the text at is where Lady Philosophy has been arguing with Boethius that ultimately um, true happiness must be self-sufficient such that when you attain happiness, it maintains itself. It's good enough on its own. So that means that happiness, we don't just want happiness for something else. I don't want to be happy so I can make a lot of money. Rather, I want to make a lot of money so I can be happy. And I don't think that formula is a real formula or a valid formula, but most people live that way. So, But notice here that happiness is something which is sought for its own sake. We don't want happiness to do something else. We want it because it's good enough on its own. In other words, happiness is self-sufficient. So this brings us to this question. So if happiness is self-sufficiency, then that means that happiness cannot be wealth. It can't be simple resources, political power, property, having high office, having glory or fame, or even these physical pleasures, right? Because, and the second point here is going to be that self-sufficiency and true power are ultimately the same. And here we have to be a bit careful. Um, we, happiness isn't about having power over others, but what we could say is that if happiness is self-sufficient, then that means it has the power for its own regeneration, Right, which means that to have happiness ultimately means to have a sort of power. So self-sufficiency and power are really the same thing. And notice here that one of the things that's occurring in Boethius' text here is he's he'll take our ordinary concepts and as Lady Philosophy offers her her arguments, that our the language and our understanding of these concepts develops. So for instance, happiness isn't having power over others, but happiness is power in a different sort of way. It's a self-sufficiency of power, right? The other thing here is that he's going to claim is that happiness is preeminent because it's worthy of our esteem. So what we have here is that happiness is one, self-sufficient. It's a type of power, but three, it's preeminent. It's the, the key thing we're after, right? Quote, therefore, a thing that needs nothing that is outside of itself, which is capable of all things by its own restraint, which is renowned and preeminent, surely it is, degree, it is agreed that this is most full of delight, right? So for instance, happiness is something that's self-sufficient, has a certain sort of power, and it's the, it's the highest, it's preeminent, which means that all of these things together, happiness is something that we delight in. And here, delight maybe is a type of pleasure, you might say, um, but he just wants us to recognize here that this is something that we naturally agree to. Now, it's true that we delight in each thing differently, but they are all the same in their substance. So, for instance, I delight in the differing forms of happiness uh, in different ways. But ultimately, all of these things have the same substance, is his view, is that happiness is what these things really are.
So we get this quote here. He says that it is human perversity that has divided this thing up, which is one and simple by nature. So the notion here is that instead of thinking of happiness as something that's complex, and by complex, I mean compounded. Happiness is this, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and so on and so forth. It's a sort of um, uh, a salad bowl mixture of different things that we think are good. This is not his view of happiness. Rather, happiness is something that is simple in its own. It is something that is self-sufficient and separate from all of these parts. Right? Notice here that humans, though, because in their perversity, is what lady philosophy would say, humans seek the parts of happiness because they think they're different. there are a whole bunch of different goods to be had. But instead, the idea is that true happiness is not a consequence of obtaining the parts of happiness in a one-by-one -one measure, right? It's not that we just pull these parts together and create a sort of pie chart of happiness. No, it's not that at all, right? He says true happiness is not to be tracked down in these things that are believed to offer one at a time while the objects must be sought, right? And that this, he thinks, or this is the argument of where some of the causes of these quote-unquote false happiness come from. So if you think that happiness is pleasure, think about it. If you think that happiness is pleasure, then that means, and you know that pleasure is fleeting, then that means that what you have to do is you have to try to compound your pleasures. Have one pleasure followed by another, followed by another, right? Which means that, for instance, if you're, um, let's go back to, if you're in a relationship with someone and you're looking for happiness with that other person, right? You want them to act in such a way. And then when you say a certain joke, you want them to laugh in a certain way. And then when you're together, you want um, to cuddle in a certain way or whatever the case is, you're trying to compound happiness together. You're trying to take the parts of things that are good and essentially weld them into happiness. And he thinks this is false because happiness is not a compound at all. Rather, it's something simple. It's either had or it's not had. It's not an admixture of a bunch of different things. And then all of these false conceptions of happiness, this is ultimately the error of reasoning, the error of reasoning being that we're ultimately trying to compound things. So what it looks like here, Lady Philosophy suggests that when we look at happiness, most human beings actually seek after the images of happiness rather than true happiness, right? So in many, many of us, we, we recognize an image of happiness when we, when we experience pleasure. And so we mistake the pleasure as being true happiness. Um, Boethius or Lady Philosophy contends that, quote, these things seem to give to mortal the images of the true good, perhaps of some imperfect goods, but the true and the perfect good they cannot bestow. And so in other words, what we have here is we have to recognize the difference between the, the symptoms of happiness, true happiness, and the causes of true happiness. What causes or enables us to attain true happiness is not the same thing as the good things that come out of a happy life. And this seems to be the sort of mistake. It's kind of like this. Imagine if you were a young child and you knew, you know, different, you had a neighbor who was extremely wealthy and successful, but kind, um, and they did all of these things. They always looked happy, right? You might think that, wow, if I can only just get a good job and get a nice car and get a good husband or a good wife and and take time to be happy and make sure I exercise, and if I just do all of those things, then, then I'll have true happiness. When what Lady Philosophy is arguing here is, no, you misunderstand. The people who have true happiness exhibit these symptoms, um, these goods, Right, but don't take the goods for the cause. It's interesting. He even uh, Boethius even mentions directly by name Plato's Timaeus, um, and where in, in that text Plato discusses the idea that ultimately, when we come to the question, these sorts of questions, we need some sort of divine assistance. And this is important because remember, uh, even though Boethius does distinguish between faith and reason, he's ultimately a, a medieval scholastic philosopher. So. He's always doing, theology is always integrated into the philosophical project in some way or another. Some way or another. Now, for most of the text here, you can see I'm skipping the verses that were read and just sticking with the prose here, just so you can keep track of where I'm at in the text. Um, and as always, keep in mind that I can't articulate everything about these texts, so I'm just pulling in the things that I found to be particularly important. Um, there's no substitute for doing the reading and the study on your own because there's a lot in here that gets discussed that we just don't have time to talk about. Okay, now the good. <clears throat> One of the things we see here is, um, whoops, I think that was supposed to say existence down here. 
is that when we talk about whatever the good is, if this good is self-sufficient, and that means it's simple, um, because things which are imperfect are not simple, and things which are perfect are simple. Now, here we have to ask us, what do we mean by simple? Simple there what we means is the notion of self-sufficiency, something which is um, good in and of itself, rather than good because it has these combined parts to it. So there's, we're talking about the language of wholes and parts. And remember here, we're talking about the essence of the good. So the essence of the good, if it's perfect, must be simple. But the question is, does that universal essence exist? Notice here the way in which the problem of universals comes back into the foreground. Um, this should say existence, right? Because what we want to ask was, does this essence actually exist? Um, now, one of, the, one of the things here is we have to distinguish the imperfect and the perfect. Now, things which are imper things are imperfect, ultimately, he says, because of their distance from the perfect. It's really this interesting, con interesting concept. His notion here is that things are imperfect, ultimately lack some sort of existence. And things which are perfect have more existence, which means that even things that are imperfect have some relationship to the perfect. So for instance, take this coffee cup. This coffee tastes pretty good. Is it the perfect cup of coffee? I'm, I don't think it's the perfect cup of coffee. For instance, I think they put too much uh, cream, cream in it. Um, but it's not the perfect cup of coffee, but it is... But the only way I could know it's an imperfect cup of coffee is by recognizing that it does have, by degrees, some elements or characteristics of the perfect. Um, I won't tr try to pretend to know what a perfect cup of coffee is, right? But get the, the idea here is things are imperfect because of the distance they have from the true absolute article of perfection, right? So think if you draw a circle, right? Like I have a circle drawn up here on the thing. If you try to draw a circle by hand, it's not going to be perfect. But it will, but the only way you can understand here the idea that it's imperfect is by recognizing the features of it which conform to the perfect circle, right? Quote, if there seems to be anything imperfect in any class of objects, there must necessarily be something perfect in them as well. Now, this is going to lead us to this interesting idea that that means that things which are imperfect participate in perfection in some manner. Notice that if you're not familiar with Plato, this sounds very, very similar to Plato's theory of the forms. So, therefore, since imperfect objects of happiness exist, right, like pleasure is an imperfect object of happiness, the perfect happiness must also exist. Quote, for the nature of the universe has not taken its starting point from diminished and incomplete things, but in procession from what is whole and absolute. It disintegrates into these exhausted things um, or the furthest removed. Therefore, it, as we have shown, is just a little while ago, there does exist some imperfect happiness and some fragile good. It cannot be doubted that there also exist a steadfast and perfect God. So lay philosophy's argument here is that because there's imperfection, and we recognize it as imperfection, that must mean that perfection also exists, but in a different way, potentially. Now, but where is this perfect true happiness? Where exactly does it dwell? Well, the first answer is God, right? Because God is all-knowing and all-good. And the other thing he's going to argue is that God ultimately is simple. And since God is all-good and simple and happiness is all simple and good, that means that happiness must be in God. So the perfect good must also dwell in God as well. And here's a quotation from, from the text. Um, um, Lady Philosophy says, And for this reason we must agree to keep this line of reasoning from regressing to infinity that God is the highest and is most full of the good, that is the highest and perfect, but we have established that true happiness is the highest good. Therefore, it is necessary that true happiness is located in this highest God. So you can see here, this is where the theology begins to meld with the philosophy. Uh oh, that doesn't look right. So there's nothing other. Um, so the goodness of God is equal to the goodness of happiness. So sort of three points, right? One, there's nothing higher than God. Two, happiness is the highest good. So three, therefore God is happiness itself or happiness. Um, God is true happiness itself. Um, so therefore God is the sum total of and the cause of all things that are to be pursued. And for that which has within itself no good at all, either in reality or in likeness, can in no way be pursued. Conversely, even those things that are not good by nature are nevertheless craved as if they truly were good. 
even if they only seem to be so. And so it happens that goodness is rightly believed to be the sum total, the center point, and the cause of all things that are to be pursued. So his notion here is that, let's take pleasure again, is that God is true happiness, but that pleasure is an imperfect type of happiness or an imperfect good. And so in some way, um, pleasure participates in God, right? Uh, but ultimately, it's not synonymous with God. Um, and so pleasure isn't to be pursued, but there is a reason in which we pursue pleasure as being good. Um, so we're trying to sort of square a circle here, run down a fine line. And this takes us to the 11th pro, pros, which this po- th- in this discussion, we see that the important, we see an emphasis on the importance of reasoning and solid argumentation. It begins really with this idea that all, um, I believe it's, um, Boethius says this to Lady Philosophy, all these points are woven together from the most solid lines of argument. So, and then he goes on from there and starts laying out his question. But I wanted to emphasize this small little phrase to you to show you that for Boethius, um, it's argumentation woven together is ultimately what should be our guide, not simply our opinions, not simply our intuitions of things, but rather we should let our reasoning guide us. And this is important because Lady Philosophy is arguing this, not a priest, not God, not an angel, but rather philosophy is arguing this. And this is Boethius' commitment to philosophy, the courage of philosophy, is that we proceed along arguments. We proceed along the lines of reasoning rather than along the lines of our passions. Now, this means that we're moving from premises to conclusions throughout the text. And what you're going to find is that this text, the Consolations of Philosophy, is an extraordinary document in terms of its precision of logical argumentation. You may not agree with all of the arguments, but they're valid arguments, whether or not you like it or not. Now, one of the questions I want you to think about is, what do you believe mostly in your life? Do you believe arguments or opinions? So, for instance, all of us have opinions, but when you're confronted with rational argumentation that you think is valid and you even think that the is sound you agree with the the claims and the arguments being made then the question is will you change your opinions many of us most philosophers contend actually live by our opinions and this may be the cause of why so much angst occurs and this is ultimately what we're going to see throughout the text is that Boethius has the opinion that his life is bad because he has been um, charged with treason and is going to be executed but the arguments will show otherwise so the question is, what do you believe? It's a difficult road for uh, Boethius, and it's a difficult road for you as well. Now, what are some of the things we discussed? So, number two, so let me take you through some of the propositions that are laid down in this text. Two is when things unify, they're good. So we get this notion here that, that things which are good unify, and things which are bad separate or disintegrate um, or degrade in some way. So everything that is good is good um, because it participates in the good, right? Sorry, I didn't really write that right. Um, everything that is good is good by because of its participation in the good. So the one and the good are the same thing. So existence, since it's, now I think about existence, existence is a unity, whereas the destruction of existence is a disintegration. For instance, examine the human body and what do you see? Don't you see that the disintegration of the body is what we consider to be evil or bad? And the unity of the body is considered to be good. So here, for instance, is a picture of um, one of the exhibitions from the bodies exhibit where people who, who died um, donated their bodies to, so that they could go on display. So you could see the anatomy. It's pretty shocking and disturbing on the one hand, pretty mesmerizing on the other. But notice here that our bodies are compounds. They're, we're made of things. And then when we die, our bodies disintegrate. They're split apart. Um, but then when we're born, things come together. And so is it true, and this seems to be his claim, is that what's good operates according to a unity, and what's bad is a disintegration. So that's an important claim that's going to be part of it, because ultimately what he's going to say here is that, oh, he's going to link it into the whole question of happiness here, right? So number six here, this is premise six. And these premises aren't numbered, I've just numbered them here. Right, things exist and perish in accordance with their nature, and this is important. So you can take a tree, for instance. Right, a tree disintegr grows only in some way; it exists in one way, but it also perishes in one way. So, for instance, notice that a tree, when it dies, it will it will drop its limbs and so on and so forth. Maybe it'll get catch fire and it'll burn. But what does a tree not do? A tree doesn't 
float up away and go. Trees don't die and then get buried, um, right? We Trees only die according to the type of thing that they are. So things exist and perish accordingly. So notice here, I have a coffee cup here, right? The coffee cup also, in his view, is something, it's a natural object. Now, I know it's artificial, but it's natural insofar as it has existence. But think, this coffee cup can only can only exist or perish in a way in which is functional to the type of plastic that it is, right? So for instance, this cup can melt, but what this cup can't do is it can't just disintegrate when it gets wet, the way paper, paper cups will disintegrate over time when they get wet. That's because everything which exists or perishes does so in accordance with their nature. Uh, I'm going to skip reading that for now so we can keep going here. Number seven is that which is fitting for each and everything is what preserves it, just as things which are opposed to them annihilate them. So for instance, you have an entity, there's beings that exist, the coffee cup or myself or you, and we each have our own nature. We have a certain way in which we exist, right? And the unity of that nature, right, is is good. And what preser- or what preserves that unity is what we would say is good. But when there's a disintegration of that nature, it's annihilation. So, for instance, if I'm eating a, eating a hard candy and I break my tooth, then that means that my teeth are disintegrating. And that's an annihilation of my own nature. It's an annihilation of my own being. And this is what we would consider to be sort of evil. So if you want, this is sort of an early picture of a natural, a sort of natural law theory, maybe, perhaps you might say. Um, it's not articulated in those grounds, and it's not really formulated like that. But it is important to recognize here that the notion here is that the preservation of unity or the annihilation in disintegration ultimately conforms to the distinction between what we consider to be good and bad, um, at least in a naturalistic sense. Now, providence, now here we are going to assume that God exists. And this is a question at some point in the course we will address point blank, which is what are the arguments that we can have for God's existence or what arguments do we not have for existence? But the notion here is that God has given all living entities a desire for self-preservation. So all of us seek unity, not disintegration, by nature. right? And I have a picture here of people who are fleeing in the hurricane from North Carolina that's occurring uh, just recently here. Uh, it's still occurring, actually, as I'm writing this, as I'm recording this video. So you see people here fleeing for their lives. Why are they fleeing? Because they desire self-preservation. They desire unity in the face of disunity, right? As the, the water waves in and their houses are disintegrated and destroyed, right? They have to seek self-preservation, a new type of unity. So notice here, what this means is that the principle of self-preservation, then, means that really, well, all things desire to be one, all things desire some sort of unity. Um, and this ultimately means that the type of unity we're ultimately after is the same unity that we call it true happiness. Because God is the goal of all things. right? What is the goal of all things, Lady Philosophy says? For make no mistake, she says. This goal is what is longed for by all things. And because we've deduced that this thing is the good, we must admit that the good is the goal of all things. Right? Uh, the good is the goal of all things, and God is the good, which means that God is the goal of all things. So this takes us to prose 12, right? And so here we see right from the beginning, Boethius, who is a lover of Plato, if you will, uh, he's, he's in, he says straightforwardly, I'm in agreement with Plato here. Because remember, if you'll recall, Plato has a theory of the forms, and the highest of all the forms is the form of the good, the goods at the top. And so Boethius is saying, yeah, this is the same argument that Plato sets out, and it makes the most sense. But Boethius says, but what are the rudders by which the world is governed? That is, how is, why is the world governed in the way it is, such that we are seeking true happiness, but it seems like we're unable to attain it. And it also seems that there's a lot of evil in the world, and we'll get to evil and more in the next book here. Um, But what are the rudders by which the world is governed, right? So let's refine the question here. First off, in order to understand what is Boethius really asking, and let's take a look at the text. He says, this world could hardly have come together into a single form out of the components so different and so opposed to each other if there were not one who could join together such different things. 
Further, this very difference of natures, mutually they are inharmonious, would decompose and tear apart what had been joined together if there wasn't one who could somehow constrain what had been bound together. So we notice that the world is composite. Is since we say that unity is good and disunity is bad, the world is a, as a series of unities. All of the beings in the world are compounded. So the question then becomes. What is it that guides things? What principle exists such that things are able to unify that are different from each other, right? So notice that the world is a diversity of entities. So what's what is what's maintaining the world such that we don't just see decomposition, right? In other words, if God is the unity and God is unchanging, is God also in motion among the particulars? And here we have a very particular acute question, which begs of a potential paradox, which is namely, if God is simple and God is totally unified and God is unchanging, then how is God actually related to all of the particulars in the world, the imperfect beings that are doing all of this stuff, right? We said that happiness is a, that when people participate in something which is imperfect, they recognize the perfect, which is ultimately somehow a part of God. The question then becomes, if God's unchanging, then how is this actually related, right? How do we bridge the changing world, the, I'm sorry, the unchanging essence of things to the changing um, particularity of the world? How do we make sense of this problem? Now, Lady Philosophy's response is, okay, well, A, God's simple. And so if B, if God is simple, then God needs no external instruments, right? There's nothing to, you have to add to God for God to do God's stuff. So C, that means that God has to arrange everything by means of himself or itself. I put itself there. The text has himself, but itself is better because clearly if God is simple, then God is not a gender, right? God is not neither male or female because God is simple. God is just God, right? Um, what we can't say is that God is all good. So therefore, all things must be arranged by the good if we just follow through the reasoning. So what is the rudder of the world? The rudder appears to be the good uh, which governs the world. Take a look at this text. He says, he, God arranges all things, I'm sorry, therefore, he arranges all things by means of the good, inasmuch as he who we concur is the good governs all things by means of himself. This is, as it were, the tiller and the rudder by which the world machine is kept fixed, secure, and undecomposed. So the notion here is that true happiness, if it's about that which is truly good, ultimately is related um, to this, uh, to something which is unchanging. Okay, sorry about that. I kind of, someone knocked at the door while I was talking. Okay, so the rudder of the world is the good, right? Now, this raises the question of why are things bad, but we'll get to that a little bit later. The other thing I want to emphasize here is that that means that Boethius here is endorsing what we would call a teleological worldview. Now, the Greek term telos means end or goal towards which things aim. And this comes really from Aristotle, but Plato also had the same view, which is ultimately that all things are organized towards a certain end, towards a certain function um, that they're seeking to fulfill. And ultimately, the idea here is that the end towards which all things are aiming is ultimately the good. And the good is what binds things together. Now, we see another argument also being pronounced here. And this is the idea that if God has all power, and if God is not able to do that which is evil, then that means the evil must be nothing. And so this is the first major argument regarding the problem of evil. Now, briefly said, we can say that the problem of evil is simply this. Why is there evil in the world? Why do things go wrong? Um, in a very simplistic sense. Now, it's more, it's even more an acute problem in this discussion for Boethius because if the good is the thing by which all things are, are aiming in this teleological sense, then the question is, well, there's a lot of evil in the world and lots of things that go wrong, right? So if God has all power, though, and God's not able to do that which evil, then that means the evil must be nothing because God can't do evil. And um, so Lady Philosophy says, therefore, evil is nothing since he cannot do what is evil and there is nothing that he cannot do. Now, Augustine had a similar line of argument, right? Augustine's line of argument was that evil is a privation. Evil is a negation of your nature. 
of what's naturally good. Now, in Boethius essentially has the same view, which is that here you are, you're a human being. Let's say you're watching this video lecture right now. You're a human being. You've got fingers. You've got legs. You have a tongue. You have eyes. You have ears. You have reason. You have all of these component parts. And that these parts are good insofar as they enable you to fulfill the function of, um, of gaining happiness or over time through reason and so forth. Right. But we also know that there's parts of you that are wrong. <laughs> right. So, for instance, maybe I, I, I have all you can see my hands here. So I have all five fingers. But maybe what if I was missing a finger? Maybe you're missing a finger. Right. Then what you could say that that's a privation of what you should be naturally. By nature, human beings have ten fingers. But we don't all have ten fingers. And that's a privation of our natural form of being, of what we should be by nature. And that is considered as something bad. Now, it doesn't, it's not evil in the strict sense of the term, but it's a sort of natural evil because it's not good. It's a disintegration um, of your function, of your natural telos, right? So evil here is the idea that it's not that evil's in the world, but it's rather that we recognize the deficiencies of the world as evil. So this raises an important question for us. Um, which I don't think Boethius answers, but which I want you to think about, which is namely, do you think Boethius actually conflates power with evil here, such that he takes evil to be the negation of God's power? It seems to me quite plausible that if God has all power, then that mean God that must mean that God also has the power not to act. But if God has the power not to act, then that means that God has the ability to negate power. So I'm not convinced of this argument myself, but nevertheless, it is the argument. Um, so I want you, it's worth thinking about a little bit. Now, Boethius' responds to, I love this, and there's a lot of passages in this text I really love from Boethius, but he says, he asks Lady Philosophy, are you just playing with me, weaving your arguments into a labyrinth from which I cannot find the path that leads out? And sometimes it's true, philosophy feels a lot like this. It feels like just like a maze that we get lost in. Uh, a, a whole, we just get our heads mixed all, turned all around in terms of which direction to go, which is the right path. And so Boethius says the same thing as philosophy students. I'm sure you also feel the same thing at times where you feel like maybe you're watching these video lectures and you're thinking, man, it sounds interesting, but I've sort of lost my way. Well, Boethius, who's much more brilliant than really certainly myself and probably you, right, also feels the same thing that we do. Now, here's what Lady Philosophy says, and I love this. She says, number one, this is hardly a game that we're playing. And I wanted to pause there for you because I want to emphasize to you that even though we're using arguments to discuss this question of what's good and what's bad, what's evil and what's not, notice that it's not a game because all of us have to live life and all of us will undergo suffering. And ultimately, all of us will be like Boethius to some degree. We may not, It's true, we may not all end up in a prison cell or all facing execution or something of that nature. But all of us will face trial and will face tribulation and will experience hardship and pain and suffering. So it's not a game that we're talking about here. It's not just a series of arguments, a labyrinth. We're actually talking about the essence of things. And Lady Philosophy says, and I apologize for the spelling errors I'm now noticing, she says, for such is the essence of the divine substance, for it never disintegrates into the things that are far removed from it, nor does it, does it take, up for, take up into itself anything external to it, but just as Parmenides says about it, it's ever resembling the shape of a sphere, well-rounded on all sides. It spins the moving circle of the universe while it keeps itself unmoving. So the notion here is that the divine substance, what is God? God is both that which is not changing, but is responsible for all motion in the universe. He's the unmoved mover, and there's a reference to Aristotle there. But, but God is simple. The simplicity, as we saw in the work of Parmenides, you can take a look at one of my videos on Parmenides to learn more about it, right? Where Parmenides thought that all of existence must just be one monetary, one mono being, just one thing that's simple with no difference, no component parts, well-rounded like a sphere. And ultimately, Lady Philosophy suggests that if we're to give an image to what God is, God must be something like this. Now, this takes us into book four, and I put Wheel of Fortune here, not because this book is about the Wheel of Fortune, but because the Wheel of Fortune is an important role. Fortuna um, is 
the god of fortune in the Roman world. And the god of fortune would spin a wheel. And if you were lucked out, you'd get the wheel of fortune and you get, you're fortunate. But most of the time when you spin the wheel, you get misfortune. And it's funny because we think of the wheel of fortune as a yay, happy thing. But in the Middle Ages, and in particular in the constellations of philosophy, in the first, two, first one and two books, uh, first and second books, the wheel of fortune is actually a nightmarish thing because it means that when you're on the wheel of fortune, when you enjoy getting good fortune, things go well and you're like, yes. And then when things go wrong, you get upset. What Fortuna would say, the god of fortune would say, why are you upset? You were, you were happy to get fortune when it was in your favor, but now that it's in your disfavor, you don't like it? You can't take one without the other. So here we're addressing sort of the wheel of fortune, particularly the problem of suffering. Now it begins, prose one here begins with this quotation, right? Philosophy had sung these words softly and sweetly, never losing the dignity of her appearance or the impressiveness of her speech, but I had not yet forgotten the sorrow that was planted within me. And so I interrupted her train of thought then, just as she was getting ready to say something else. So it starts off here, and Lady Philosophy is saying all these beautiful things and singing her songs, and she's about to go into some other great truth, and of course, Boethius interrupts her, right? And he wants to know about the problem of evil in particular, right? We, I know that, that we had a sort of argument regarding the problem of evil in the last book, but it doesn't seem sufficient for Boethius. In other words, he thinks the problem runs a bit deeper, right? Why does evil exist at all? Why is it that evil people live unpunished, right? It looks like evil people uh, frequently survive. And so, for instance, um, I don't want to say evil necessarily, but I'm thinking of there was recently a... Uh, a gentleman by the name of Scott Pruitt, who was in charge of the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency of the United States. And it came to light that he was using, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to take trips, vacations, and all this kind of stuff. Corruption, essentially. But you can ask yourself, but look at him. Even though maybe he's not the EPA director anymore, he's still wealthy. He still is famous. He still has lots of opportunity. It looks like people who do the wrong thing oftentimes don't get punished and it oftentimes look like it oftentimes looks like that when people commit evil they actually benefit so wait what you're telling me that they're the evil is just nothingness how can that be right how can the helmsman of this ship god allow all of this because if the rudder of the ship is the good and we've got all these people hacking each other up topside how can this happen so the problem of evil is a bit deeper than that, right? Think about the gross wickedness that thrives and has dominion in the world. The wicked prosper while the good suffer. And here I put an old picture, it's sort of pixelated so you can't see it well, of the Nazis after they took France. And here is um, Hitler with all of his top com commandants marching right next to um, the Eiffel Tower. Why is it that evil people prosper and good people suffer? Now, Lady Philosophy responds, right? She says, since you've seen the essence of true happiness through my previous demonstrations, right? That it's simple, it's self-sufficient, and so forth. And even come to recognize where it's to be found. In God, Lady Philosophy says, I will show to you the way that can carry you back home. I love this sort of imagery. Um, is that the problem of evil has, has taken us somehow away from are the central thesis here. The, the good is self-sufficient in God, ultimately. So how do we get home? Well, and, and here's where we get to the second prose, right? Lady philosophy, number one, is going to reject the idea that good people suffer and the evil prosper. So if we go back to here, what we'd say is that the, the way you get out of this is by denying the claim that the good suffer and that the wicked prosper. Right? How are we to do that? Well, ultimately, the argument that she's going to give is laid out in the idea that ultimately we have to identify what the good is, what, what it means to prosper, and what it means to suffer. And what we're going to see is the evil itself is a type of suffering, and the goodness itself is a type of prospering. And such that when the evil person commits evil, that is, at their, uh, that is suffering itself. And when a good person acts justly, that is um, prospering itself. 
So let's let's take a look at the argument. Well, actually, hold on. There's the premises, right? Number one, powers in the possession of the good and evil lack strength, right? What she wants to argue is that when people are good, they have power, and when people are evil, they lack strength. Now, you may not think this is the case, but remember, good and evil are opposites. And if evil is unable to sustain itself because evil is a type of disintegration, then that means that evil is fragile, where the good is stable. Now, if the good is stable, it's only the things which are stable that have power. So now, so you can see here that that the good has to, by its own reason, by our own reasoning, must have strength over evil, which lacks strength, because of the notion of unity and disintegration. You can see he's building, or Lady Philosophy is building her argument. Now we can also consider both will and power, because we have a will to do things, and we have certain capa capacities to do them as well. So, for instance, you have human capacity, right? Human capacity, um, from human capacity, we see that people seek that which is good. And all human beings share in the good. And what this means is that means that evil can't be a strength. So take a look at the passages, right? Number one, he says, each person must be thought to be powerful in regards to that which he can do, but must be thought to be incapable in regards to that which he cannot. Makes sense. And then she goes on. All mortals, so us, you and I, right? All mortals, the good and the evil, right? The the Hitlers as well as the Mother Teresas, all of them, he Lady Philosophy would argue, strive to reach the good by their indiscriminate striving. So here, don't worry about who's evil and who's bad, but all people are striving to do what's good. They're all seeking the good. Now, we know that evil people are not good, or they don't do good things, so there must be the idea is that evil people strive to do what's good, but they somehow fail, whereas good people strive to do what's good, and they somehow succeed. Right, and then a little bit later on, on on line fourteen. But if the evil secure for themselves what they crave, which is the good, then they cannot, they couldn't be evil, right? Since both the good and the evil seek the good, but the former do secure it while the latter don't at all. It's not a doubtful is is it not a doubtful proposition? Is it that the good are powerful while the evil are incapable? Right, which seems to make sense. Now he gives the examples. Consider a human walking. It, like, compare a person who walks on two legs versus people who try to walk on their hands. Which one of these are easier? Now notice that human beings, he, or he actually uses Plato's definition. Plato's definition of a human being was a rational animal that has two legs. That's us, right? But notice here is that you have legs, but if you try to use something else, that is, your legs are made for walking, your feet are good for walking, right? You might even say, and this is all teleological, but you might say that um, our, our feet evolved evolutionarily to let us walk. Our hands did not. So you can see here is what is it better? Is it easier to walk on two feet or is it easier to walk on your hands? The answer is obvious. It's easier to walk with two feet. Now what this means and why is this important? It means that what we can say is that maybe this is analogous to the difference between good people and evil people. Where all of us are seeking to go somewhere, we're all seeking the goods, so we're all trying to walk. But some of us walk on our feet correctly, and others of us walk on our hands. Who has more power? Who can walk quicker? Clearly, the person who walks correctly, right? So that means that where is evil coming from? It comes from our ignorance. Now, here's two quotes. Uh, Just observe how great is the weakness of corrupt men who cannot even reach the goal towards which their striving leads them and practically forces them. Just look at great, what great powerlessness has lawless men in its grip. So here I had an example of um, um, uh, Richard Nixon. So he was a former president of the United States that committed crimes um, in order so that he could gain an election, uh, right, because he wanted to win office, and so he hired people to break in um, to the Democratic National Committee's office and steal their documents and so forth. Um, and then guess what? He won election, but then he got caught for doing it, and he lost the presidency. So notice here that Richard Nixon was trying to gain something which he thought was good, but he went about it the wrong way, and it actually created it, it, just, it revealed how what, how much weakness he actually had. That his corruption was the weakness. That he was actually power. His lawlessness made him powerless. Um, so ignorance is the problem and the root of evil in men and in human beings. 
Um, it's not the evil or people. Now, evil men are evil. So he, um, Boethius doesn't want to deny that people who commit evil don't are evil. But what he means is, but what he doesn't mean is the evil exists and it's pure and in a simple sense. Evil is nothingness, right? What we see in a corrupt person is a diminishment of who they are. The person of the evil derives, um, the, I'm sorry, the power of the evil derives itself from the incapability of a person, not their strength, right? So um, the, what looks like power to us when evil and wicked people act is actually powerlessness. Now the wicked have therefore a false type of power. He says, and this false power proves even more clearly that they have no real power. For is for if, as we deduced just a little while ago, evil is nothing, then since they only have the power to do evil things, it's clear that the unrighteous have no power at all. So that means that we have to recognize that, one, mortal power is limited, and that only a madman would believe otherwise and think that they have the power of God or something. And number two is that God has all the power and is not evil. God has all power and is not evil. And number three, evil persons clearly have less power than God. So we get this quotation. Only the wise have the power to do what they long to do, while the unrighteous, though they may keep themselves busy at whatever they please, do not have the power to accomplish what they long to do. And here, notice, it does seem to be the case. A person who commits evil is never satisfied, even when they accomplish what they, what they seek out to do. Why? Because they're longing for something that their evil can never get them to. Ultimately, it's God. Now, here's this beautiful poem, um, and I thought I'd read at least one of these poems to you. This is the second meter for book uh, four. And it's about the idea that of, he's basically talking about the fact that it seems clear that there are evil people in the world. He writes, High, exalt high exalted tyrants sitting on their raised thrones, can you see them? Brilliant in the blaze of purple through the high fence of their grim spears, glare and threaten without pity in the hot breath of their mad hearts. Could you strip away the trappings from the pride of their adornment? Underneath you'd see these masters in the tight chains of their shackles. Here is lust with acid poisons, discomposing all the lifeblood. Anger whips the mind to frenzy on the high seas of the passions. Sorrow here exhaust, exhaust her captives, or inconstant hope torments them. When you see one single person thus enduring all these tyrants, he does not do what he wants to, overwhelmed by cruel masters. So this is sort of a beautiful phrase, but sort of the idea there is that evil people, whoever you imagine them, they may look great, but underneath them, in their minds, their soul is shackled, um, right? So let's keep going in prose three, right? Is it the case that good people are rewarded and the crimes of the evil people are actually punished? Now, the good itself is the goal for all human actions. We've already shown that. So that means that no matter how brutal evil people may be, the crown shall never fall from the head of the wise man and shall never wither. So in other words, the good itself is the goal of human actions. And to act well and to act justly is the reward of the good. The punishment of the evil is actually the acting out of evil. So just as righteousness itself becomes the reward of the righteous, so too is gross wickedness itself the punishment of the unrighteous. Now, some of you may be thinking, okay, Mark, wait a second, hold on. You're telling me that if a person commits a murder and gets away with it, that their action of the murder is itself the punishment. Um, and that would be right. That is what he's arguing. Because, even, because ultimately, if the goal is good itself, and you've instead pursued that which is evil, you've actually destroyed yourself. He says, God is the one... Um, God is one, and the one itself is good. That was the notion we talked about from the beginning in book four. And whatever falls away from the good ceases to be. That's the notion of disintegration. So that means that the evil fall in terms of disintegrating their own humanity. And so I found this picture. I don't know who this person is, but I imagine this person is a criminal of some type, and they've scratched a swastika in their head. Right, And so this is a good example of someone who, it appears, has um, lost evil. And insofar as they've, they've committed evil acts, potentially, allegedly, they're disintegrating their own humanity. 
right? They are deunifying themselves. He says, or Lady Philosophy says, and quote, so it happens that evil people cease to be what they once were, but the very appearance of a human body that remains shows them up as having been human before, and for this reason, because they have turned towards evil conduct, have lost their human nature as well. So the idea here is that evil distorts our humanity. He says here that evil met metamorphosizes us. And so it comes about that anyone whom you see metamorphosized by vices, you can no longer judge to be a human being, right? One man, a savage thief, pants after and is ravenous for the goods of other people. You can say that he's like a wolf. Another man, vicious, never resting, has his tongue always in motion in lawsuits. You can compare him to a dog always barking. One man, hid, the hidden plotter, lying in wait, is glad to steal by his deceptions. He can be said to be the same as a fox. Another wars, giving free rein to his anger. He may be believed to be to have within him the spirit of a lion. Um, one man, a coward, is quick to turn tail, afraid of things that he's not, uh, that he is not, that he need not fear. He is thought to be like a deer. Another indolent and slack-jawed is simply inert. He lives the life of an ass. One man, fickle and flighty, changes his interests constantly. He is not at all different from the birds. Another wallows in foul and unclean lust. He is held under by the physical light, delights like a filthy sow. And so it is that anyone who has ceased to be a human being by deserting righteousness, since he has not the power to cross over into the divine condition, is turned into a beast. So in other words, when we commit evil, we dehumanize ourselves. We become like animals. And notice, what do we do with evil people in our society? We house them like animals, right? We cage them like animals. Notice, right? So that means that we can say is that if a person is evil, they're going to be less happy. And if they're less happy, then that means the evil brings desolation. And desolation is disintegration. Quote, the righteous are more happy when they suffer their punishments, when no penalty derived from justice represses them. So here the notion is, is that it's not just the idea that evil destroys us, but the idea that when we're punished, some good is brought back to us. A unity is brought back into formation, which means that we should actually seek punishment when we can, can commit evil because the punishment of the wicked adds good to the evil person. So take back that picture I had of the neo-Nazi there who had a swastika on his forehead, right? Assuming that person was a criminal. What we could say is that to punish that person actually makes that person better. Uh, that's actually his notion. Um, he's going to say that the evil are overwhelmed by weightier punishments precisely when they believe that they're unpunished. So to not punish a person who's committed evil is actually to allow, allow a greater evil still to occur. Lady Philosophy says, quote, once their eyes have been accustomed to the darkness, people are not able to rise them up to the penetrating light of truth. They're like the birds whose vision the nighttime illumine, illumines through the daytime blinds them. So long as they do not look closely at their place in nature, but only at their own passions, they think that the license for their crimes or the impunity for their crimes is a happy thing. So here you can imagine, you can go and see what, what do criminals think about when they don't get caught. They think that they've done a good thing and they've survived because they didn't get caught. But the problem is they've actually dehumanized themselves and they're actually lost in the darkness. They're lost in foolishness. So this means that the injustice that is done to someone is a desolation, not for the one who receives it, but for the one who does it. So the greater the victim of evil is the one who commits the evil. I'm not saying that if someone commits evil on someone else, there's not a victim, and that's not a terrible thing. But it's but the greatest victim is the person who actually commits the evil themselves. Um, and in some ways, I can imagine some of you will strike back and think that diminishes the the, the severity of the victim's suffering. And I can maybe understand that argument. But on the other hand, I think there's something right about it. A book I'd encourage you to take a look at is Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, where it's about the main character who commits a murder. And it's about what it does to him psychologically. And that really mirrors this same insight of Boethius's, which is that the person who commits evil is actually a greater victim of the evil than the person who suffers the injury. 
right? Um, not that either are good, right? Now, what does this mean? How should we treat evil people then? The thing is, we have to realize that an evil person is therefore a dehumanized individual. They're broke their um, damaged goods. So we need to treat the evil person as a patient who needs to be led to the physician, right? So that means we need to think of punishment as something that's medicinal, right? It's, in, it's, in we, it's never okay to hate an evil person, Lady Philosophy says, because to hate an evil person is to do evil yourself. Um, so we see here that the notion of punishment that Boethius is introducing here is punishment in the form of to help a person become just again. It's medicinal. It's for their soul. It's not just to get back at them, as it were. So this brings us to the question, okay, what about evil and God's providence and chance? How can we make sense of those? And here we see Augustine saying, in fact, I'd be less amazed, uh, I'm Boethius, I'm sorry, and in fact, I'd be less amazed at this were I to to believe that all things are confused together by chance occurrences happening at random. But as it, um, as it is now, the God who is the helmsman, right, who uses the goodness as the rudder, makes my incomprehension that much greater. Given that he, sign, he assigns delightful things to good people and calamitous things to evil people, but on the other hand, assigns harsh things to good people while granting to evil people the things that they desire. If a reason for this can't be discovered, what is there here that differs from chance occurrences happening at random? So here Boethius is saying, okay, if you're saying that when an evil person commits evil, that is their punishment, then, well, what's different than that about chance? Because it seems like that means that everything goes. Well, here's the first thing is that all changes, uh, all um all changing things happen according to God's divine mind. So nothing happens that is left to chance. Chance is itself an illusion, or in other words, chance is actually really a lack of our own anticipation of things. Because all things that come to pass change in their causes and order according to one good thing. And fate is really just the arrangement that inheres in things that have motion. Um, and, he, and the arrangement through which providence weaves together all things in their proper order. Providence embraces all things equally, despite the fact that they are different, and despite the fact that they're infinite. So, Boethius' view is that, listen, from God's perspective, the things which you call evil are really just a part of the organization of God's ultimate plan, which is good, right? And so you have to separate, if you will, the threads from the tapestry, right? And that there is nothing, quote, that happens for the sake of the evil, not even what the unrighteous themselves do, end quote. So all things happen for goodness and according to God's desires, right? And in this regard, therefore, whatever you see happening that falls short of your hopes, though, to your opinion, is it is a topsy-turvy confusion. For the things themselves, it is in the right order. So the notion here is that, listen, the problem is you. You misunderstand why things occur with you because you do not recognize the larger picture and that ultimately all things are happening are happening according to God's providence and according to God's goodness so providence produces the remarkable supernatural occurrence that evil people make evil people good so in other words the idea here is that it looks like in history is that God uses what we might call as evil people or evil actions in order to make other people um, learn so in other words the suffering that occurs can be used for the instruction and the betterment of other people to the advantage of later people. Uh, now, this sort of leads, I think, to a problem, which is namely that means that the Holocaust was evil, was really a good thing because it allowed us to learn from the mistakes of the Jewish nation. That seems to me to downplay the problem of evil. Um, and many thinkers have looked at this. A book you might want to take a look at is Richard Bernstein. A uh, friend of mine um, and teacher of mine, uh, but he writes a book called Radical Evil. Take a look at that, which takes on some of these problems, uh, but in a secularized way. Uh, but this is the basic notion that Boethius sets out. So this means that divine providence uh, means all fortunes, good and bad, are good. So no matter what happens, it must actually be a good fortune, right? That means that absolutely every fortune is good, and it's whether it's a delight or a calamity. It's handed down, sometimes for the sake of rewarding or training the good, sometimes for the sake of punishing or correcting the unrighteous, 
then every fortune is good since we've agreed that it is either just or advantageous. So we get this sort of interesting formula where the good is to our advantage, plus the idea that fortune trains and corrects, plus the opinions about um, fortune are not to be trusted. Um, and for this reason, the wise man, uh, Boethius says, ought not to take it with annoyance whenever he's drawn into a struggle with fortune, just as it's shameful for a strong man to take offense whenever the roar, the roar of the clash battle is heard. Um, so some great imagery going on here. This will take us to our final book here in the last book of the Consolations of Philosophy. And here we really are going to continue to follow up the question of divine providence and divine foreknowledge and whether or not we really have free will. The first thing here is we have to recognize that chance is not a cause, right? And that because chance is merely about our anticipation of things, and when that purpose is unknown and we don't know why things happen, that's what we call chance. So, for instance, the example he gives is a farmer goes out to plow their fields. They accidentally discover that there's a, a pot of gold buried in their, in, their, in their field. They say that they've discovered it by chance. Why? Because they didn't intend to discover it. That wasn't the purpose of digging the hole. That doesn't mean that it just occurred randomly. That means someone there buried a pot of gold, right? So chance is not the same thing as a cause. Chance is really just our lack of anticipation of something. Now, does, the next question, though, is does divine providence negate human freedom, right? And here we get the probably the most interesting and I think the most um, sophisticated argument of the consolations, which is ultimately going to be the idea that it doesn't negate human freedom, but the, the problem is that the question goes awry itself. Okay. So let's add to the problem. The problem gets tougher even in prose three, right? Where uh, Boethius uh, says here, for if God sees all things in advance and cannot be mistaken in any way, that things must necessarily happen that providence foresees will happen, right? If God knows all things and God knows what's going to happen tomorrow, then what's going to happen tomorrow must happen because God knows it. And for this reason, if providence has foreknowledge from eternity, not only of the actions of moral men, but of their deliberations and in their wills, then there would be no freedom of independent judgment. For there could exist no action, no will of any sort, other than what divine providence, which does not know how to be mistaken, perceives beforehand. So the question then becomes is, does divine foreknowledge actually preclude freedom? Now it's very interesting and important here because even though this is medieval philosophy, this entire discussion mirrors the very same discussion about freedom and determinism that modern philosophers have today. Where modern philosophers look at it more in terms of the causal nexus of things, right? There's a causal history and a causal order to everything, so how can we really be free? Right There it's a sort of secular version of the same question, um, but slightly different. It's not the question of foreknowledge, but it is a question of determinism. Now, here's what Lady philosophy says in response she says for number one this is an old complaint about providence so this isn't nothing new right and i understand why you're complaining about this right but here's the basic argument to counter the objection first we have to recognize that human knowledge cannot be conflated with divine knowledge right human knowledge comes from our senses and our senses are temporal so when I talk about what's going to happen tomorrow, and I talk about, let's say I'm drinking this, and I'm debating in my mind, should I drink now or should I drink after the video? And then I make a choice. You can see there is that the only way that I understand that, that I can make a choice that's going to take place in the future is because I have sensation that things are changing through time. So my senses are temporal. And that means that my knowledge is organized according to this framework of temporality, of time dimension. Whereas divine knowledge, because if God stands outside of time and God knows all things, this means that divine knowledge is something different. Now, it really comes in prose 5, but he's going to say that divine knowledge really treats every moment as the now because God is everywhere and in all times all at once. It's not the idea that God knows what we're going to do. It's rather the idea that God knows right now what we are doing right now, but in the future, our future, but his present or its present, right? So in other words, the problem of divine foreknowledge is not of the same quality as human knowledge, right? Whoops, here I want to, whoa, let me go back here. There's a quote I wanted to read you, right? Um, uh, here we read, quote, namely, 
that the higher power of comprehension embraces the lower, but in no way does the lower rise to the level of the higher. Now, there the argument that, oops, that Boethius is saying is that we have these capacities and some are higher than others. So, for instance, um, like think about animal intelligence versus human intelligence. We have the ability to understand why, for instance, a cat is startled when you drop a pan on the floor. Right, we recognize that, but a cat does not have the same ability to recognize why we reason about how much our tax bracket should be, for instance. So it looks like that the higher orders of reasoning in nature um, can understand the lower orders, but that the lower orders are incapable of understanding the higher orders. It's clear that God has a higher order of rationality and knowledge than we do, since we cannot understand what God says. Now, this means that, number importantly in Prose 5, is that when we talk about a divine foreknowledge, that is not the same thing as talking about a necessity of causes, right? Boethius writes, for your discourse is as follows. If there are some things that are not seen to have definite and necessary outcomes, then there can be no definite foreknowledge of them as outcomes. Consequently, there is no foreknowledge of these events. Were we to believe that there is foreknowledge in these things as well, there will be then nothing that does not come to pass through necessity. And yet, consequently, were we able to possess the judgment of the divine mind in just the same way as we are partakers of reason, then we would think it is most just the human reason surrender to the divine mind. So here you have to give up on the idea that you can fully comprehend it. And that importantly, and this is what I mentioned forecast earlier, is that we have to recognize that for God, eternity is now, right? And I quote, since every judgment grasps the things that are subject to it in accordance with its own nature, and since God has an ever eternal and ever present moment condition, his knowledge as well has passed beyond all the motion of time and is stable in the simplicity of its own present. It embraces the infinite reaches of what has passed and what is to come, and in its own simple perception, it looks at all things as if they are being carried out now, which means that God really is in a different dimension than we are, uh, because God is atemporal. And this will be an important discussion we'll talk about later. So this means that God's foreknowledge doesn't preclude our freedom. The idea is that we're free, but that God is at all is with us in all moments in which our freedom. Um, emerges, right? So it's necessary that a thing exists if providence sees it as a present thing, even if it has no necessity in nature. And so the idea here is that that means that we are free, even though God knows all things. Quote, for the divine gaze runs on ahead of everything that will come to pass and twist it back and calls it back to the present of its own proper perception. It does not, as you reckon, switch back and forth in an alteration of foreknowledge of now this thing and now another, now stable, now unstable, and so on and so forth. Rather, the divine knowledge embraces all of your changes in a single stroke, which means that ultimately God does know all things, and even though, in, in the means, we're also equally free to act, right? So, this is sort of where we come to the conclusion, and this is the last section of the whole book, where ultimately, what we're told is that, that we should pursue God, and that's what happiness is, and that it's not misfortune, um, that fortune is irrelevant, ultimately. And that if we're to say anything at the end, it means that we should avoid these vices. We should avoid our vices. We should cherish our virtues, raise up our minds to the blameless hopes, extend our humble prayers into lofty heights. And unless you want to hide the truth, there is a great necessity imposed upon you. The necessity of righteousness, since you act before the eyes of a judge who beholds all things at all times. So we're left here with Lady Philosophy saying, listen, if you trust your reason, then you'll realize that the good are actually rewarded and the punished are always by necessity punished. Um, and then this, and that God is ultimately at the center of it all. And that's what goodness is. And that this is something that's ever present in all moments. And so this is the sort of consolation of philosophy that Boethius is able to gain. Um, and as a consequence, Boethius, I think, faces death with greater courage. And sadly, he was himself executed. 
Um, but notice here that despite his execution, we don't even know anything really about why he was executed. That tells you how unworthy it was. But notice that the things he's written in the Constellation of Philosophy have, stead, uh, have stayed the test of time. Okay, now that concludes our discussion of the Constellations of Philosophy. Next time we're going to be taking a look at Pseudo Dionysius. In particular, we'll be looking at the problem of religious and uh, philosophical mysticism within the Middle Ages. Thank you very much for watching the history of medieval philosophy. I'm Mark Thorsby, and I look forward to seeing you guys online next time. Bye.